You have heard the song. I, I guarantee it. You can't always get what you want. Rolling Stones made that popular several years ago. I'm not going to date anybody in the audience because I'd be dating myself. But they sang that. In fact, it was so important to them that if I remember correctly, they sang it three times, right? You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. They're trying to drive the point home. Were the Rolling Stones prophets from God? No. But that statement sure hits. Because you and I wrestle with the reality of wanting stuff now. My son is selling his house in Salem, Oregon. He is already living in my house in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Not a problem. Big house. I'm not home anyway, so it's really no big deal. <laughs> Yet in his mind, he thought for sure the house will go up for sale the week after we move out. We'll have an offer by the end of that week. They'll love it so much that we'll close at the end of July. I'll be able to put an offer down. In fact, he was ready to move into his new house in Hortonville, Wisconsin, or near Hortonville, Wisconsin, by the 19th of August. You can't always get what you want. All of us are confronted with that reality. Because all of us still have an ugly sinful nature that wrestles and struggles to lift its head away from our navel. Call it navel gazing. It means to be self-centered. And that is our natural sinful reality. It starts at birth. Our children want two things, to eat and to sleep. Don't try to upset the apple cart and put one before the other, because the child will be angry. Later on, as the child grows up, his tastes get a little bit more sophisticated. He wants to eat and to sleep and to have a rattly thing in his hand. That rattly thing turns into Legos. Rattly thing is a lot less expensive. The Legos turn into college. And later on it turns into that son staring at his own navel wondering, do I have enough stuff? In fact, isn't our society generally driven for us to try to answer the question, when do you have enough? I pity those of you who are going to be moving. Because you've got to get rid of stuff. And probably as you go through them, you wonder, well, what should I keep and not keep? What's of value to me? What is going to be something that 20 years from now I can look back and say, oh yeah, that's why I kept it. And then realize that 20 years down the road you pick that up and you say, huh, why did I keep this? Because things here on this earth, even though there is an immediate value, that value never lasts. <laughs> Clothes come in, go out, come in and go out of style. Shoes on children, you might as well just put your money in a shredder. Because they go through shoes like nothing. And all of our lives dictated by that ridiculous notion. Well, ridiculous insofar as we grab on to what Jesus has to say and realize that honestly, there is nothing here on this earth that you and I should really be worried about. So, I'm going to tell you today, again, it's not going to be the first time you hear it, and it won't be the last time you hear it. Don't worry. And I know some of you are thinking, be happy. That's not where I'm going. <laughs> Don't worry. Because you know where your treasure is. Even in Jesus' day, 
that they wrestled with this concept of stuff and possessions. So Jesus had to get them out of the navel-gazing, out of the worrying. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. That, that almost sounds foreign to us, right? You and I are constantly worrying about our life. Plans for our children, our plans. What are we going to do with our work? What are we going to do with our playtime? We're, we're, we're always got these things on our minds. And Jesus says, don't worry about that. In fact, it gets very specific. Don't worry about what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. I repeat that verse occasionally for my 28-year-old daughter. I don't think it's stuck. But notice what Jesus says. Life is more than food and body is more than clothes. In fact, he goes on, Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And aren't you more valuable than birds? Well, what is Jesus doing? First of all, he's identifying a sin that plagues all of us. That sin of worry. And what is worry? Worry is when something is out of our control. And yet we obsess on it. Thinking that we can control it. I, I, I travel a little bit by air. We have another pilot in the audience. When I am sitting in the middle or the back of the plane, I'm not worrying because I can't go into the cockpit and get the guy to change. I have to trust him. When I'm sitting on the ground and the time thing up there keeps changing, delayed, one hour, two hours, three hours. I'm sure that never happens with Allegiant, so I, I can bring that up. Because I fly Delta. <laughs> When, when I see that, what, what can I control? What can I change? And yet I look around and I see all these people frustrated, worrying that they're not going to get where they want to be. Jesus says, that's a misplaced effort. Look how much God takes care of the world. Look how intricately God makes everything in the world work out, including occasionally dropping a lot of rain in very short time in the desert. All because he knows what is right at the right time. And if it's out of our control, don't worry, Jesus says. Now, some will say, no, wait a minute, Pastor Flunker. I, I've got a house full of kids. I, I've, I've got a husband or a wife that comes home. They're, they're expecting to see something to eat, so I've got to worry about the eat. I've got to worry about the clothes. I don't want my kids to go outside naked. And, and, and you're right. You don't want your kids to go outside naked. But Jesus says don't worry about that. And here's where you have to realize what this worrying sin is. When you worry about something, you are trying to change the outcome. Notice, Jesus did not say, don't be concerned about what you're going to eat. I've been a strong proponent in my life of teaching the difference between concern and worry. When I'm concerned about something, I'll pay attention to it. I'll realize the parameters. But I'll trust that through the work that I can do with it, and the Almighty God, it will work out the way He says. That's concern. If I worry about it, I'm pushing God completely out of the picture. I am somehow thinking that by my actions, by my doing, I can change the result. And therefore, I have to make the effort. I have to put in the sweat equity. I have to do the work. Because there's an underlying reality there. After I do all that, I want the glory. I want to be able to see, see, see how I changed that? See what I did? Yeah, I worried really hard, and that got changed. And yet, what does God say? Don't worry. 
You can't change any of that. Even if you were to work 24-7, 365, you can't change it. Because God is the one who feeds and clothes the ravens. And you're worth much more than they. In that whole next paragraph where he compares Solomon to the flowers of the field, he just more succinctly emphasizes the fact that what we have here on this earth has no lasting value. Oh, it has value when we put value on it. But the truth is, virtually everything that we put value on, on this earth, will disappear. I could put value on a wonderful piece of ribeye steak. That'll disappear in 15 minutes. I can put value on a new home, a new automobile, and the minute I drive it off the lot or move into it, the value changes and I didn't control a thing. I can put value even into my, my friendships, the people that I, that I hang around with, or my work. And once again, even if I'm a self-employed business owner, I don't have control over the outcome. And when I pass away, what happens to my business? What happens to those friends when they commit a sin or I commit a sin and the friendship is broken? You see, when we put value on those things that need not have value on earth, that's nothing more than the cauldron to create a big bowl of worry. Jesus says, take that away. Why? Because you know where your treasure is. And therefore we focus on the last paragraph. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Did you hear that? You didn't think you had anything. You looked at your life and you said, yeah, I, I don't have anything because my neighbor's got a newer car, newer boat, newer house. And yet, what did Jesus just say? The Father has given you the kingdom. Notice, he didn't say the keys to the kingdom. That comes later. He's given you the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Well, it's really two things. First of all, it's the preaching of the gospel. Where the gospel creates faith. Faith trusts in what Jesus has done in order to get us to that second kingdom. Heaven. Eternal life. God has given you heaven. You didn't work for it. You couldn't. You didn't buy it. There's no layaway or long-term financing that you can get into to buy heaven. You can't trade up to it. It is a pure and simple free gift from God. In fact, he even gave you the tools to believe in that gift. Just like he gave Abram in the Old Testament. Just like he gave all of those, those um, Old Testament patriarchs and people who believed, who trusted. And it was credited as righteousness. Why? Because faith given by God that trusts in who Jesus is grabs onto the kingdom. Recognizes that kingdom as a gift from God and says... That's where my treasure is. Why? Well, Jesus explains. In that kingdom, it will never fail. No thief will come near. No moth will destroy. You see, everything that we put value here on this earth is susceptible to failing. It's susceptible to being stolen. It's, success, it, it, it's susceptible to well, just falling apart. Those of us who went to college knows it's called entropy. Because, because sin does not keep things together. Sin causes destruction. Even on that which is material around us. But the treasure that we have in heaven does not fail. Does not get stolen. And no moth can destroy it. Because it's a treasure that God prepared. 
It's a treasure that God designed. And it's a treasure that God ensures and backs up. And he did it through Jesus. Through Jesus' perfect life here on this earth, through his innocent sufferings, through his giving his body and blood in this sacrament, to his resurrection, which confirms for us that the last enemy of mankind, death, has been defeated, taken off the table. God ensures that we have a treasure waiting for us. And so therefore, we don't need to worry. The problem is, is that we're going to. Our sinful nature is going to continue uh, to make us look at ourselves, think about ourselves, and because of that, we are going to worry. So that's why I always remind people, don't navel gaze. Don't look at your own navel. Lift your eyes to heaven. Put your focus on that treasure. Remember that that treasure can't be stolen, won't ever fail. No moth will destroy it. Put your eyes on that treasure because Jesus tells us something incredible. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we don't want or need a heart that is filled with worry. Thanks be to God that Jesus has taken that away, wiped it away. And he's replaced it with the opportunity through faith and the ability through faith to, to stare at that heaven. Knowing that it is there as sure as the promise that God gave Abram. You're going to have a son. Sounded impossible. God delivered. Heaven is yours. Sounds impossible. God delivers. Because that's where our treasure is. We don't need to worry, because that's where our heart will be. You can't always get what you want, repeated three times. But I think you know the next line, right? You just might find you get what you need. I don't think the Rolling Stones ever wrote anything more spiritual than that. Because that is biblical truth. We have what we need. Eternal life, one for us by Jesus, his life, his death, and resurrection. We have an inheritance in heaven. We have a treasure. That's what we need. And that's what's been given to us. So don't worry. You know where your treasure is. Amen.